That's the challenge before us. Help us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, before I uh, get started, uh, I didn't know if he was going to be. I can't believe this guy's here today. Uh, this just speaks to the miraculous power of God. This guy yesterday was on, well, he may have been off the surgery table at this time, but he had emergency back surgery yesterday. Man, these Baxters, they're tough people. <laughs> but as I look at Jonathan, it's a miracle. You just want to say something? It's, it, <clears throat> I don't know what to say. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. <laughs> If I gave the microphone to your dad, he could say about 30 minutes, I guarantee you. <laughs> Praise God. Let's give a round of, of, of applause to the healer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. And here's the deal. We all know that the Baxters love Jesus and that Jesus loves them, but I'm here to tell you, folks, Jesus loves you too. And what he did in Jonathan's life, he can do in your life. The Bible says in Romans 2 that he's no respecter. He doesn't show favoritism. He's no respecter of persons. Praise God. Good to see you here, Jonathan. I did not expect that this morning. Hallelujah. Last week, we started talking about freedom and how most of us have something we are in bondage to. And we used handcuffs to illustrate that, that this is the bondage. This represents the bondage that all of us have. We're bound in some area. We don't all have it all together. If you think you do, you're bound. That tells me that you don't understand the nature of bondage. Depending upon what we are in bondage to and how good we are at hiding it will determine if those around us know about it. And we focused last week on where do we start? If you want to get free, where do you start getting free of any bondage you may have? We said number one, and I don't know if this is in chronological order or order of importance. I don't know. We just mentioned two things. Number one, we need to start with us. And Jesus started in John chapter 5, and we gave you that story with the man by the uh, pool of Bethesda. Remember that? And Jesus asked him the question. He wasn't being mean or anything or smart aleck or anything like that. He simply asked the guy, do you want to get well? Your bondage and being free from it starts with you. Do you want to really be free from it? It starts with you. And then secondly, we talked about it starts with Jesus. You're going to need Christ in your life to get rid of that thing. And he wants to help you get rid of that. Today I want to deal with why we stay in bondage and the basis for freedom. Now let me just say, uh, folks, uh, I'm not just patting his back. Uh, he's secure in who he is. and uh, We've got uh, all kinds of people that are gifted and, and God has brought to us Terry Baxter. He wrote a manual. Isn't that a nice cover that I made for your manual, Terry Baxter? He's got great information in it, but he needs some publicity people around him to, to kind of dress him up a little bit. Now, notice I did not go with Times New Roman font. Did you notice that? Uh, he wrote a spiritual warfare manual. Uh, we need to make this. Here's your million-dollar idea to fund missions. You need to get this in book form in book form. This is absolutely knockout. I read it in two nights at my home this past week. Uh, absolutely knockout material, and we're going to be using Terry uh, throughout this uh, year uh, uh, at least a couple times to get him involved because he's got more experience in the area of deliverance than I certainly do. And he has some phenomenal stories. Even his wife was involved in some of them. And uh, absolutely phenomenal material. And uh, uh, what I'm preaching, some of my ideas uh, maybe pulled from his book uh, or manual. And then there's another book. It was written back in the year 2000, so it's 22 years old, but it is phenomenal. Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker. Every Christian needs to have this book in their library, uh, The Bondage Breaker. It's phenomenal. And so uh, I will be referring to that, these two and others, uh, 
when I preach on freedom. We're just getting involved in this immense subject. I want to deal with why we stay in bondage and the basis for freedom today. Why do we stay in bondage? Why do we stay handcuffed? There's four passages of Scripture when I was reviewing my notes this morning. In fact, I'm reading all three Bible schedules, and I noticed today in the Gospel Blitz Bible schedule from Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, that uh, Father brought his son to Jesus, and in fact, first brought him to the disciples, and that boy, the Bible says, had been that way since childhood. He had been that way for years, okay? He had been bound with that spirit for years. Luke chapter 8, you see that in your notes. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 27. This demoniac, this guy had been that way, the Scripture says, for a long time, Years in that situation had been bound. In Luke chapter 8, verse 43, the Bible says that woman had that infirmity there or that bondage for 12 years. This is what I want you to get, the amount of time that they suffered with their bondage. In Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 13, this woman had this spirit for 18 years. She'd been in bondage. And then in John chapter 5, we talked about that last week, that guy had that bondage, had the cuffs on for 38 years in bondage. Why do we stay in bondage? All the years, all the days, the weeks, the months, the years we waste in bondage. Why do we do that? Why do we continue to struggle so long with the same bondage through the years. Some examples or some reasons why. First of all, many times we stay the way we do because we cannot find help. Some of you, some of us, we've sought help but to no avail. Apparently people had tried to help the demoniac in the story I just shared with you because they had bound him and the chains couldn't keep him bound. The one passage says that the woman that came to Jesus, she had spent all she had. She tried to get help, but to no avail. The father tried to get help for his son. He had been that way from childhood. He brought his boy to the disciples, but they couldn't drive the demon out. He tried. Some of you remember back six years ago, after we got done with the building here, uh, I went into a, a health funk, if you will. And uh, there were days I walked with a cane. I didn't know what was going on. I, I went to one doctor, couldn't get figured out. He referred me finally to a rheumatologist over in Mason City. Went to that rheumatologist, and he said, it can't help you go home and take two ibuprofen. I wanted to grab him by the collar and say, if two ibuprofen would have cured it, you would have never seen me. Came back, went back to my doctor. He said the same thing. I fired both of those guys. I got another doctor. She put me on the elimination diet, and she honestly tried. She says, well, if we can't get you figured out, we'll refer you to mail. But would you let me try? I said, okay. I went on the elimination diet. Anyone ever been on that diet? Some of you have. Went on the elimination diet. They thought maybe it was aspartame, something else I had in my diet, maybe too much tomato-based stuff. Uh, that didn't work. She then thought I had Lyme disease because I do a lot of hunting in the fall, and, and I just knew that wasn't it. I was confident that wasn't it. Finally, she got me an appointment. She said, I'll get you an appointment. That was like in April. She couldn't get me in until July something up at Mayo. My wife and I, in the meantime, in April, we went down to Mexico to see our kids. While down there, it just hit me like a tank. And my wife said, do you want to fly home early? You know it had to be pretty bad. And I said, no, I'm, we're going to stay. We got home on a Friday, and she said, I'm taking you to emergency up at Mayo on Monday. And my wife did. A doctor up there, emergency doctor, said, we're going to get you figured out today, but we're going to get you figured out. She expedited that appointment. She got me in that Thursday, three days later, an hour with that doctor. He had me diagnosed. I called Bev from Mayo Clinic, and I said, Bev, would you please run to, remember that, Bev? Would you please run to the uh, pharmacy and get the medication because I wanted those drugs as soon as I got home. I didn't want to wait till Friday morning to start taking them. 
I started taking them, and by Saturday morning, I had my life back. It was that fast. My point is, some of you are struggling, and as I was struggling for months, trying to figure out what is your bondage, how do I get free from this thing, and you've gone everywhere, and you've talked to doctors, or maybe you've talked to other pastors, you've read books, and you're still bound. I just want to encourage you, keep pursuing the help. Some people give up and think that they have to be that way the rest of their life. That's a lie of the enemy. More about that in a moment. Secondly, why are we in bondage? Some of us, if the truth was known, we simply like what binds us. We like the cuffs. Well, pastor, what do you mean? We like the alcohol. The flesh likes that. The Bible says, Hebrews 11 and verse 25, there's pleasure in sin for a short time. Some of these things, hey, they're shiny. Don't they look nice? It feels good for the time. Yeah, but wait till the hangover. Wait till it destroys your marriage. Wait till you lose your job. It takes all your money. And it destroys you. Truth be told, some of us like these when they're on. Some of us, number three, we stay in bondage because we do not understand, now get this, the difference between fault and responsibility. Now stay with me. This is good stuff that you're getting this morning, if I say so myself. Some of us, we stay in bondage because we don't understand the difference between fault and responsibility. Let me explain. Can I have my assistant come up here again this morning? Didn't he do a good job last week? He put up with Pastor Will, and I asked him if he would indulge me again this morning. I want you to know that I am going to put these on him. Now, he's doing that, but let's just say he put up a fight. I think I could whip him. I don't know. I certainly have him outweighed. But let's just say I jumped on him. And I had his arms behind his back. And let's just say that I put the cuffs on Malachi. Okay? He is bound because I put them on him. Y'all with me? He's bound because I put them on him. However, have you ever been a kid and you were dinking around with something? And you got yourself in trouble? <laughs> you ever remember them, them finger cuffs they used to have? You'd put them in. All of a sudden, you realize you can't get out. And you did it to yourself. Well, let's just say Malachi is playing around, and he cuffs himself. I want you to know, I could stand back. You know I put the cuffs on him. But had he been playing around and he put them on by himself, he would still be cuffed. It doesn't matter whether I did it to him or he did it to himself. It really doesn't matter whose fault it is at this juncture. Now, maybe in getting free, you've got to consider that. and There may be some other things, and we'll talk more about that down the road, that it might put some complications to. But for the most part, if you're cuffed, you're cuffed. It doesn't matter whether he did it to himself or whether I did it to him. Y'all with me? It may not be his fault, or it may be his fault doesn't really matter here's the key you can go on a lock i want the cuffs back uh, the point is this there are people that cry out it's not my fault and they may be right it's not my fault that i have the bondage my father abused me so i have a unhealthy interest in sexuality or my father did this or Somebody said this, or I had people in my life, adults in my life, that said I was no good. And that may be true. And I was raised with that. I was abused. That may be true. And you would say, it wasn't my fault. Not your fault, folks, but it is your responsibility to now deal with it. And so some people stay in their bondage because it wasn't my fault that I was abused. And I don't want to be harsh this morning. I, I feel for those of you that had a dad or had some family member that abused you. I did not. I had an awesome dad in raising me. Just recently lost him in November. My dad. My dad. And so I don't have the painful memories 
that some of you have. And I, I want to be sensitive to that. And I want to say and speak into your spirit this morning, if you were abused, it wasn't your fault. It's not your fault. But you can't continue to use that as excuse for not getting help. May not have been your fault, but now it's your responsibility. Don't you want to change in your life? Do you want to continue to be bound up with the cuffs? Do you want to continue to fight against these things the rest of your life? To spend 12 years, 18 years, 38 years like these guys in Scripture? Don't you want to be free? See, it wasn't your fault, but it is your responsibility now that you know about it. Number four, why are we still in bondage? It could be that we have believed a lie or we've been deceived by the enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, now notice this next word, like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion. My Bible tells me in Revelation 5 and 5 that I serve a Savior who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't ever make the devil out to be a lion. He's not. He's a liar. He's not a lion. Are you with me this morning? And so he likes to feed lies to God's people. John chapter 8 and verse 44, the Bible speaks about he has no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is the father of lies. Many of us, we stay bound because we've believed a lie. We've believed a lie that the devil said through maybe an adult in our life, you'll never be worth anything. You're no good. You're not smart. remember a high school counselor, I believe it was, said to my brother, my brother is a brilliant individual. He's a great guy. I don't know if he's as great as I am, but he's a good guy, okay? He had a high school counselor said something to the effect that he wasn't college material. Now, fortunately, my brother overcame that, and he's run the family business for years. He's a great guy. He's not stupid, but he could have bought into that that a counselor said to him and believed the lie and lived the rest of his life according to what was said over him. And many people do. They believe lies that are said about them. The reason many of us have stayed the way we are is because we believe the lie given us by the devil. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He also blinds the minds of believers at times. He feeds them lives. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 15 that he masquerades as an angel of light. And so he feeds us all kinds of lies. He'll say things like, it wasn't your fault, but that's the way you got to be. Sometimes, though, the devil will tell you it was your fault. There are kids today that were abused. Now they're adults. They've grown up, and they believe the lie that the reason Dad abused them, it was their fault. That's a lie. Some of you believe the lie from the devil that you'll always be that way. Some of you believe the lie that you deserved what happened to you. That's a lie. Some of you believe the lie that you're unlovable. You're no good. You're dirty. I want to be real personal. As a pastor, I've had the awesome privilege, as you all know, of doing something I've loved to do for 33 years here in Clear Lake. And through that time, I've gotten to know individuals, gotten to know some ladies that I've met in the community, and they've sold themselves so short. You'll go to talk to them and they won't even look you eye to eye because they're embarrassed. And they believe the lie that they were dirty, that they were no good, that they were second class. 
Can I just say this? That they were a piece of meat. And so they lived their life that way. And I'll see them in the community, and I want to say, oh, honey, you're better than that. You are better than that. But you sucked in that lie that you're no good. I just want to put my arms around them and say, you're better than that. Particularly the older I get, I'm becoming more, I used to be a dad figure. You know you're getting older when now you're the grandpa figure. But I want to tell you what, guys, those of you that are grandpas, there are all kinds of hurting grandkids out there that need a grandpa that will come up and will speak the truth in their life instead of the lies that the devil has fed into them. And so for those of you that are grandpas, you may not be able to turn the heads of the young gals anymore. Don't worry about that. You can do something far better. I love going up to individuals. I love going up to little kids and stuff and just pouring myself into them. And speaking the truth instead of the garbage that the devil has spoken in to their lives. So some people are in bondage because... They believed the lie. Let me just say this, and I'm going to move on. If you're talking with the devil, you need to understand you are having a conversation with a liar. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like talking to a liar. <laughs> uh, you can do a lot of things to me, but you lie to me. That irks me. That really irks me. And so if you're talking with the devil, just know he's going to do his thing with you lie to you second point i want to talk about this morning is this truth is the foundation of freedom isn't that right terry baxter he talks about it in his manual truth is the foundation of freedom we live in a time where people are trying to get free by using all kinds of methods of depraved minds I want to be careful there because my spirits, sometimes I bring a sledgehammer when all I need is a little, little finish hammer. That's the nature of my personality. I'm a bull in a china closet sometimes. And I want to be careful because I don't want anybody to be hurt. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to get free this morning. We live in a time where people are trying to get free by using methods of depraved minds. The Bible speaks about this in Romans chapter 1. I think this is one of the most prophetic passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 1 verse 28 says this, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. The sad thing is, we've got many people in professional positions, psychiatrists, psychologists, not all of them, but many of them are in professional uh, positions, and they're ministering, and they're working with a depraved mind. And they're giving advice to people, and it's nothing but bunk. It's not the truth. Let me give you some examples since you ask. For example, a young woman finds herself in an unexpected pregnancy. There are some in the medical profession, how you deal with that problem, that bondage. The Bible calls that bondage baby. How you deal with that is you just go terminate the pregnancy. That is bunk. That's a lie. We've got people saying that. That's how you deal with that bondage. You just go terminate it. You have an abortion. Get on with your life. Now, what they don't tell you, the rest of your life, you're going to have to struggle unless Jesus does a supernatural work in your mind when you encounter truth. You're going to struggle with the fact that you took the life of your child. And they don't tell you that. Now, thank God the CPC in Mason City, a ministry that we support here at the church, the Caring Pregnancy Center, they'll tell you the truth when you're contemplating that abortion. Another example, to find meaning in life, you go to school, the counselor will say, go to school, do your best, get good grades, get an education, then go to college. You get out and you get a good paying job, you make lots of money, and you will be happy. Young people, listen to me, making lots of money will not make you happy. Now you can try that, 
But I just want to encourage you, read the book of Ecclesiastes if you don't believe me. Read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll find out it doesn't work. It doesn't work. There are people that have won the lotto and they have millions of dollars and they're not happy today. Money does not make you happy. But that's a lie that many give into. Now, I don't watch TV other than the news for the most part. I did not know this. I say this as gently as I can. I just use an example. Some of you are into this and you pay attention to it. A week ago, today, former Miss USA, Chesley Christ, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Miss USA in 2019, had a phenomenal job. She finished in the top 10 of Miss Universe. She jumped out of her high-rise apartment to her death and committed suicide. She was making all kinds of money, but she was still bound. How great it would have been had someone recognized that and said, oh, honey, your value is not in your looks. Your value is in your heart. How tragic it was that she didn't get the help and her bondage caused her death. Money won't make you happy. And there are all kinds of examples of that, young people and old people here today. It won't make you happy. Let me be very sensitive in this area. I want you to know you have a friend. I have had individuals confess to me that they've struggled with their sexual identity and I've never breathed a word about it to anyone. Nor would I ever do that. I promise you, I'm a bull in the china closet, but I promise you I'll be your friend. I won't make fun of you. We have people struggling with their identity, sexual identity. Some in the medical prof profession are saying, you are what you feel you are. Now, I understand that that may make you feel good at the time, but that's not the truth. You are not what you feel you are. You are what you are. And the Bible speaks the truth that God made you male or female. And we're doing people a disservice when we tell them, well, you can just be whatever you feel you are. That's not the truth. And that won't set people free today. And yet we've got all kinds of educated individuals that are telling people that, and it's not freeing individuals. Instead, they would be freed if they would turn to what the Word of God says the truth. Take your Bibles very quickly. I just want you to know, I didn't get started until 5 to, five to 11, okay? Just, want, just clarifying that. John chapter 14. Not, not much longer, I promise. Just stay with me. I want you to be free. I want you to get free. John chapter 1, look at verse 14. The Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's a good place for the church to be. We've got to have grace and we have to have truth. We have to be full of grace, and we have to be full of truth. Jesus was both. In John chapter 1, verse 17, For the law was given through Moses' grace, and truth came through Jesus Christ. Flip over to John chapter 8. Isn't it something that the gospel of John emphasizes truth? John chapter 8, look as 31 and 32 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free telling people what they want to hear. You can be anything you want to be, or you are what you feel you are. Folk, that may make them feel good, but that won't free them, because that's not the truth. John 14, 6, you know what it says. Jesus said, I am 
the way, the truth, and the life. And then John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. Let me close with a couple of thoughts. If you study encounters that people need to have to get free, they normally will fall. In fact, I can't think of any exception to this. They will fall into two categories. Number one, they need to have a truth encounter. Truth encounters take care of most bondages. Needs to be a truth encounter. Reading from Neil Anderson's book, page 33. I have learned from the scriptures that truth is a liberating agent and that has proven to be the case in every successful counseling session. Jesus is the truth and he is the one who sets the captive free. Power for the believer comes in knowing and choosing truth. We are to pursue the truth because we already have all the power we need in Christ. Furthermore, people in bondage are not liberated by what I do as a pastor, but what they choose to believe, confess, renounce, and forgive. More about those four things in upcoming weeks. Most of the time, people can be free if they have a truth encounter. Now, having said that, most bondages involve the mind somewhere along the line intersecting with truth. To get a new way of thinking will involve your mind encountering the truth. That's what the Bible shares in Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind. How does that happen? Through the truth. By the way, some of you want to be free, and we like instantaneous freedom. We like when I give the keys to Malachi, and he has to open them up, and he's freed instantly. We like that, but we need to understand, a lot of times, it's going to take some time to walk out. Why? Because you're going to have to renew your mind, and that takes time. It'll be a progressive type of walking out your freedom when it comes to a truth encounter. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24 says the same thing about renewing the mind. Now, with truth, you're going to have to learn to take captive thoughts that are not of God. And many of you, you're held in bondage because you've believed the lie, all the thoughts that the devil has injected into your minds, and you've bought into those lies, and that's why you're bound. So now you're going to have to learn, and that takes some time to learn, how do you take a thought captive? Y'all with me? If I had, you ever notice when you're at a, a, a like a professional football game or Particularly, uh, it's notorious when you go to a professional baseball game. You ever noticed how a hot dog can smell like a T-bone steak? (laughs) Now, we're right before lunch. If I had a hot dog that just came off the grill and it came wafting over to you, and I told you not to think about that hot dog, not going to happen. You're going to think about that hot dog. Well, there are ways that you can get rid of thinking about that hot dog. Number one, remove it. But it's the same way when you're bound. You're so engrossed in that, you need to learn how to take thoughts captive. And I intend throughout this year, we're going to deal with that, how to teach people to take thoughts captive. The last thing, or the other thing that you need to have an encounter with, And not all people need to have this. Uh, And this is where I am going to uh, get the help of my brother, Terry Baxter, because I know he's had a lot of experience, certainly way, way more than I have, is you need to have a power encounter. And that's when it really gets exciting. A power encounter. Due to demonic oppression and possession, some people have given place to a spirit, a demon, or demons... And that spirit needs to be dealt with. And some of you may right now have opened up the door and you're wondering why something's going on in your family. You've opened up the door and you've allowed some demonic presence in. And and we're going to have to uh, get involved in teaching you how to shut the door. But some of you are allowing that in. I'll just meddle in one area and then I'll close. Some of you have what I call the bail box, called a TV or your computer screen. 
Pastor, I just don't understand why I'm struggling with lust. Let me look at your computer. Oh, I don't want you to go there. See, we open up the door. If you want to really be free, remember I mentioned there's four things. You're going to have to learn to renounce that thing. Repent of that thing. Ask forgiveness. And then kick it out the door. Cut it off. Oh, remember what I said, why we stay bound? Some of us really like that. And we don't want to do that, and so that's why we stay bound. So we're going to deal more with that. Two scriptures that illustrate the above two encounters. Mark chapter 10, that was the rich young ruler. Uh, that guy didn't have a demon. Remember, uh, he came to Jesus and he said, all these things have I kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said one thing. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. That guy did not have a demon. He was not demon-possessed. The problem was he encountered truth, and he wasn't willing to follow the truth. Some of you, you've encountered truth in your life, but you're not willing to embrace the truth and accept it and use it in your life, and so you're still bound. The rich young ruler did not have a demon. Now, this other guy, he did. The demoniac, he had many demons. He had thousands of demons. He was in trouble, okay? That guy, he needed a power encounter, okay? Rich young ruler, he had a truth encounter. And that would have saved him. Demoniac needed a power encounter. See the difference? I just want to close with this. There is hope today for you to be free. I don't care how long you've been in bondage. Some of you are still bound because you're not willing. This is hard, but it's not harsh. Some of you are still bound because you're not willing to repent and renounce the sin that you've been involved in. Many bondages people are in can be dealt with by simply repenting and renouncing your sin and turning away from them. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I, I ask that you would take this word and you let it sink into the spirits of these people. Let it sink into my spirit. There may be some here this morning, Lord, that they know the truth. They're just not willing to embrace it because, frankly, they're enjoying that bondage. I pray, Lord, that you would help that individual or individuals here, if that's them, that you would help them break free. Help them to embrace the truth. Help them to see the lie that they're giving into. And Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit just to continue to bring conviction until they get to the point saying, I want to embrace the truth. I want to live the truth. I don't want to live this lie any longer. Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to get deeper into this. But if you're here this morning, and you're bound, I, I promise you I will not embarrass you. But you'd just say, Pastor, I need help. Would you stand? I won't ask you to do anything more than that this morning. I need help. God bless you. Three guys standing. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Lord, I pray for these that are standing today. I ask you, God, over the next several days, over the next several weeks, 
that you are going to bring to everyone who is standing here truth to them. I believe most of these things can be dealt with by a truth encounter. There may be some, Lord, that it, it, it's more than that. There it could be an evil presence there, a demonic presence. And we'll deal with that. But most of these, I believe, Lord, could be dealt with through a truth encounter and embracing the truth. And so I ask you, God, this morning, that everyone that's standing, they would take responsibility. They wouldn't keep saying, well, it wasn't my fault, or even though it's my fault, I can't break through. They would take responsibility. To say, I am going to deal with this. Because I don't want to be bound a year from now. I don't want to live my life like this. And so I pray, Lord, for all these that are standing today, that they would get a hunger for freedom. They'd realize it starts with them. They know Jesus wants to move in their life. And I pray, Lord, it would be like when you curse that fig tree. The root would be cut today. And from this day forward, help is on the way. As they renew their minds in whatever area that it is. I pray, Lord, that everyone standing would seek help. They wouldn't give up and think that they're going to remain that way the rest of their life. But they would go after help in the name of Jesus. I pray. You may be seated. One last thing I, I just want to share. It starts with Christ. It starts with a relationship. We shared with you last week. Some people say, well, I want to get cleaned up before I come to Jesus. No, you come to Jesus in your adultery. You come to Jesus in your drug addiction. You come to Jesus in your alcoholism. You come to Jesus when you're uh, beating your wife. You come to Jesus when you've mistreated your kids. You, you, you come to Jesus first. And he'll walk you through. He'll help you. I love you, church. You can beat that thing. You can beat that thing. Now, we, we got a lot of teaching to do. But you can beat that thing. I, I want to give you hope this morning. You don't have to be that way the rest of your life. You can beat it. Am I supposed to close the service? I am. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to be real simple. Have a great week, church. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>